Hey guys, this is a quick video on how to do a uh, suspended timber floor on the ground floor, which uh, a lot of uh, houses have a suspended timber floor on the uh, upstairs, first floor, uh, but um, it's less common on the ground floor. So it's going to have a look. Uh, we're, we're nearly ready to start putting some floor joists in now, so we're going to have a look what's going on. So in this instance we've got uh, a, a sloping sloping ground and so the um, so the the DPC is a lot higher above ground level at the bottom than it is uh, near the house. So ordinarily you will probably have something like this um, and this would carry on all the way around rather than it uh, sloping down like it does here. Um, so what we've got here on the wall if we can find them, is we've found some markings and uh, we've drawn some markings rather and and this one here is for finished floor level so we transferred that level out with using an optical level you could use a spirit level and some pegs if that's all you've got um, and then we've come down an inch to allow for carpet or tiles or timber flooring or, you know like oak flooring whatever we're going to have inside and then we've made that the top of our timber. Um, so that's that's the level that we've been aiming for with our um, with uh, with our strings for setting out, and um, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's the top of this level here. We didn't it, the joints when you're coming up the uh, building your block work or brickwork it's important to watch the the joint thickness so here we've got a really thick joint probably three times as thick as normal because we realized that we were not going to quite make it up to this level so what we had to do was um, when we realized that that was the case we uh, decided to come down within about come up to within about three centimeters of the string so not quite reaching it but we've kept that same the same all the way around so although we didn't quite reach our target height uh, we've um, nonetheless kept everything level so anyway back to the timbers so as we can tell from our marks the top of the timber is here so we brought up this block here so it's going to be uh, the timber that we're using will rest on the on it with a thin bed of mortar at the bottom and come up to this level here now if it, depending on your span how far it is from one side of the foundation to the other you'll need a different thickness of timber um, so if you if you were to google for um, um, timber span tables on google you will find all kinds of tables showing you what thickness of timber you need to span a gap obviously if you use something too thin then when you stand on it it will bow in the middle and that won't be very good um, so uh, that's why you should always consult a span table or if you're doing the inspection route for um, building regs then then the building inspector will probably tell you what thickness of timber you need and in my case I'd, I'd already ordered my timber uh, after looking it up in a span table but um, the building inspector he said to use a use a, a smaller timber so I could have got away with a smaller one but I'd, I don't one thing to bear in mind is if your timber is too thin then it, it will f flex when loaded and so uh, even weights because when when we put the upper floor in uh, the first floor that will be timber as well and so if people are jumping around upstairs it will transfer through the stud partitioning down onto the ground floor and dark uh, all the floors will shake so people running around upstairs will disturb people downstairs so I've gone for a quite a, a much thicker than needed timber here we needed a, a, a 18 a 47 mil by 180 mil in a C16 timber and we and I went for a 47 by 225 mill in a C24 timber so it should be nice and rigid and I might put some proppings on the oversight here um, 
to uh, stiffen it up further. Um, so one thing to consider when you're doing a suspension timber floor is your oversight, which um, strikes me as a bit of uh, an elaborate use of concrete, wasteful rather, but uh, being it's all going to be covered over. But uh, I think it's to stop uh, maybe reduce damp coming up and also stop anything growing. I'm, I don't really know, mushrooms or something? I don't know why they put it down. But uh, yeah, so you need um, 10 centimeters of concrete or five centimeters with a deep damp proof coarse damp proof membrane underneath. So in this instance, we've gone for 10 centimeters. And now this void underneath the timber flooring has to be ventilated. So um, we've, uh, we've got these uh, periscope uh, ventilation. Uh, what do you call these? Um, well, we call them conduits, but that's not the right word. I'll put, a, I'll put a little caption in to show you what they're actually called. And so we have um, an air brick, which goes in the inside, outside. Have I got one of those around somewhere? So this is your air brick, like this. Now you need, with the holes, you need 1,500 millimetres squared of, of holes per linear metre of wall. And anyway, I got a bit confused how to work that out. The building regs guy just said put in one of these every two metres. Okay, so um, that's so that'll be three down this side. Watch you don't drop that down the cavity or that'll be fun getting that out. Uh, that slots in there like that. Hang on. There you go. So from the outside, it will look like that. And you need to um, leave it a little bit proud of the wall, perhaps, to allow for your render on the outside. Um, although I might recess mine, I don't know. But we'll see. So. There was much confusion about these because they can either go above or below the DPC, it doesn't matter. I've seen that written in an NHBC document, so I think that's an accurate thing to say. And our rollout DPC, this stuff here, will be put along the wall like that. Okay, you unroll this roll here, and that will go all the way along underneath the timbers. And then we'll have our outer one stepped up here because at the back, the ground level is a bit higher. So if you look online for uh, suspended timber floor details, you'll see that a stepped DPC, provided it's not, obviously you can't put a tray in here, you can't join the two together because water would flow to the inside skin. So you can't do that. Um, but you can have, um, separate uh, damp proof uh, courses uh, of which are stepped um, and then what we'll do to get around the fact that um, water may track uh, when it comes down the cavity it might land on here and then dribble down here and, and come to the inside leaf which which would cause a damp patch on the inside so we'll have a piece of DPC coming down like this uh, wider stuff we've got some it's like this but it's about half a meter wide and so that will come up here up one block and then tie in and so any any dribbles coming down the cavity which there probably won't be any but any dribbles that might come down the cavity will hit that and they will get scooped around and pushed down to the outside leaf so you won't ha end up with a damp, damp patch in, in on the wall, inside wall so um Anyway, we'll have another look at this when I put some, I put some timbers in, and um, and and we'll see how it goes. So I just thought we'd come down and have a quick look at the timbers, uh, which arrived yesterday. Now, a standard length for a kind of piece of timber is 4.8 meters, and something to consider is that when you've got um, a 4.8 meter long timber, which is uh, two inches by eight inches or 47 mil by 225 mil uh, and, and it's treated it's bloody heavy and it's a bit of a struggle to lift one of those by yourself to be honest so um, now 
so that that is that is one of the arguments for not having it treated and i'm not quite sure if you can um legally if you like according to building regs use untreated timber but um when they treat the timber they put it in a pressure vessel and they impregnate the whole board with um with like a solution of chemicals in water and um so all these boards are saturated with water and they're bloody heavy so um that's going to be a struggle i mean what i'm going to do i'm going to cut them down here near the stack and then um i'll be able to cut a roughly a meter and a bit off the end of each one which should lighten them up by approx 20 percent so um that's worth considering uh and obviously if you've got a a narrower span and then, then they'll be lighter and um and as I was saying in the earlier video clip, I went for a thicker, a taller timber, um, optionally, to to reduce any chance of the floor bouncing, which uh, may have been a bit silly, bearing in mind they're so flipping heavy. But uh, there we go, cross that bridge when we get to it. So um, underneath this uh, suspended timber floor, we need to provide some ventilation to um, stop uh, any uh, build up of uh, moisture under there which might lead to condensation on the underside of the uh, underside of the, the suspended floor so according to my um, building inspector we need uh, one of these um, uh, brick vents every two meter run of wall so this is seven meters long so we'll need three along here um, so how we've done this we've got uh, the DPC will run underneath this one and, um, and on the inside it sits on the, the vent casing sits on on the DPC at the bottom there as you can see so there's quite a bit of confusion when we were trying to figure out how to put these in uh, in the end we found uh, an NHBC guide which uh, stated we could have the vent set below or above the DBC and in and so that gave us the option to do what we're doing here um, the, uh, the other option would be have them set much lower down uh, but then you would have to have your ground level well below that so in this case we would have to dig out this all through here which uh, wouldn't mean too much work I suppose but uh, there's enough to do without barrowing around loads of soil um, so there you go that's roughly how you install a um, Obviously these go between the uh, between these floor joists here and um, we use some engineering bricks here to make the um, provide some cuts and blocks perhaps uh, but uh, I've opted for bricks as uh, they're a bit quicker to use in this this circumstance anyway thanks for watching So this is um, a suspended timber floor on the ground floor um, and uh, we've just started um, putting some noggings in after looking online and trying to find actually how, how many uh, noggings you need uh, per distance of timber. So I couldn't find any reference to them in the building regs but uh, I found some within uh, some mentioned for strutting uh, which is uh, a bit different to noggins that's where you have they call it herringbone strutting there's even a wikipedia page on it but you have a diagonal this way and a diagonal that way and um, it stops as with uh, these noggins it stops the timbers twisting so uh, you don't want them going from side to side like this uh, when in use um, 
Now if you here we've got the joists keyed keyed into the um, inner leaf of block work. So we don't need a noggin at this end because obviously by the time we've got a few extra courses on there on top of here these will be well very much very solid and very unlikely to twist at all. In fact they won't be able to twist. So um, brain freeze. So if you were using a joist hanger, a metal galvanized joist hanger, which runs down the inside of the inner leaf and the joist sits in a, a galvanized steel bracket, then they've got potential to twist from side to side. Um, so you would need a, uh, a noggin on along here in that instance. Um, but if you're spanning up to uh, four meters, uh, according to the NHBC guide, then you only need a central noggin or strutting, whatever you want to call it. Um, so uh, there you go. Thanks for watching.